chapter number 9. John chapter number 9. Keep your, your, your passage of Scripture open. We're going to travel throughout uh, these about 35 verses today, 34 verses. And so make sure you keep it all uh, open. John, St. John, the Gospel of John. Everybody found it? Chapter 9. I'm just going to start reading a couple of verses. I'm going to start at verse number 13, and then I will paraphrase 1 through 12. Verse 13 says, They brought to the Pharisees him that aforetime was blind. And it was the Sabbath day when Jesus made the clay, and it was on the Sabbath day that he opened the man's eyes. Then again, the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. And he said unto them, He put clay upon my eyes, and I washed, and now I see. Father, I thank you for the presence of the Lord that's in this room. I thank you for your spirit, and we want to honor you. We want to praise you. I thank you for the word that you've laid in my spirit to preach today. And I pray, God, that you would help me to preach and have your anointing, yoke-breaking anointing. Help our eyes to be open to see a manifestation. But let our hearts and our minds be open to receive the word that you've given us today. In the mighty name of Jesus, and everybody said, Amen. I want to preach today on this topic, characteristics of willful unbelief. I want you to really listen today, uh, characteristics of willful unbelief. I think most of us in this room would probably agree that faith is the most important component in our walk with Christ. After all, the scripture says we're saved through faith. We walk by faith. We live by faith. Our prayers are answered with our faith. We know that a small amount of faith can move mountains of impossibilities, but yet the church seems to suffer from a lack of faith. And it makes great sense to me that the enemy would come in and strangle faith from our lives. He does anything he can to shift our focus off of faith and onto religious values, religious requirements, and religious expectations. The enemy of our soul knows the potential that's in each one of us. We have the power to do impossible things if we operate in faith. And it's available to everybody in this room, every teenager, every preteen, every kid, every memo and papa. All of us, if we activate faith, can do incredible things for the kingdom. So, of course, it makes sense that the enemy would cause us to shift our eyes off of that because he knows your potential. Today, I want to, you to examine yourself. Let's examine all of our hearts. I want you to be honest. I want you to give a true report of your faith. I want you to be honest. I want you to examine your faith. In our text, Jesus uses a blind man in verses 1 through 12 as an object lesson for his disciples. They see this blind man, and, and the chosen 12 said, well, whose fault is it? What is it, his mama's fault? Was she in sin? Was the daddy in sin? Or was this man in sin? And Jesus says, no one sinned to cause this man's blindness. I've reserved this man's condition so that I can display my power in him. I've allowed this man to be born blind so that I can show you that I have power over blindness. And in a point not intended to make, let me pause and make an unexpected point. Because I wonder if some of you are going through some things in your life right now that God brought you to a certain place and allowing you to go through some things so that he can display his power in your life. It's not a condition because of sin. It's not a condition because of a curse. It's not a condition because of you're out of alignment. The problem is God is trying to display power in you. Some of us may find ourselves in situations because God wants to show you some power. Ah, oh, the religious group of the day, they were offended this man was healed because it was the Sabbath day. It was the holy day. And Jesus had to do work on the Sabbath. And that's supposed to be a day of rest. And oh, he had to make clay and he had to put it on. And that breaks the law. And oh, they were angry. That how dare somebody break the law so that somebody could be healed on the Sabbath. I want to look today with that thought in mind at five characteristics Five characteristics of willful unbelief. And Sadie, you may have, there it goes right there. For some reason, me and my remote were not in sync. 
Five characteristics of willful unbelief. Number one, it sets false standards. Let's look at verse 13 through 16. And they brought to the Pharisees him that aforetime, the man that used to be blind. And it was the Sabbath day when Jesus made the clay. It was the Sabbath day when he opened his eyes. Then again, again, means they've already done it once. Again, the Pharisees asked, how did you receive your sight? And he said unto them, he put clay in my eye, and I washed, and now I see. Therefore said some of the Pharisees, this man is not of God, because he keepeth not the Sabbath day. Others said, how can a man that is a sinner do such miracles? There was division among them. The Pharisees were in this place, they were in this dilemma, trying to disprove a miracle. They had set standards for themselves that God would never allow to be broken. He would never allow a healing on the Sabbath that would cause someone to break the day of rest. But it was never intended for this to be the case when God instituted the day of Sabbath. For unbelief sets standards that are not biblically based and are not theological sound because we need it to fit into our capacity to understand. We need it to fit into our capacity to be able to control the situation. And we too often will dismiss a God thing with the church standard that has nothing to do with God, has nothing to do with His Word, has nothing to do with holiness, but we will miss a mighty move of God and dismiss it as ungodly because it goes against a standard that we use to prop up our own unbelief system. Y'all with me today? I made a Facebook post saying this will challenge all of us. We'll say things like this, I don't feel comfortable with a move like this. I don't feel comfortable with those people shouting like that. I don't feel comfortable with people staying in the altar during uh, preaching. I don't feel comfortable with the way the music is flowing. I don't feel comfortable with this, so it cannot be from God. Grandmother did not do this this way 70 years ago, and she was very spiritual. So I know this can't be from God. And we set up all of these standards that have more to do with our comfort, our traditions, and our convenience, and our control than God's mercy, and God's grace, and God's love, or God's power, because we don't want to dare give away to anything that would release us of control and power. How dare God move when we can't control Him? Oh God, we want you to move at the design time and we ask that you move in the way grandmother was moved upon and we ask you to move on the way that my parents were moved on in the Methodist church that was after the shouting Methodist. And Oh God, I, I'm comfortable with the way the Baptists receive you but God, how dare you just be God because we don't like it, we don't feel, we don't even believe that way. No, what we have done is we set up a standard that dismisses God because we don't feel comfortable with it. We will set up false standards and call them holy. Secondly, verse 17 through 23, unbelief always wants more evidence but never has enough. Verse 17, they said unto the blind man again, what, what do you say of him that he opened your eyes? And he said, he ha he's a prophet. But the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been blind. Listen, they did not believe the man had been blind. They didn't believe he'd received his sight. So they called his parents of him that received his sight. Verse 19, and they asked him, Is this your son who was born blind and now he sees? His parents said, We know that this is our son. And we know that he was born blind, but by what means now that he sees, we don't know, but he's of age. You ask him. These words spake his parents because they feared the Jews, and the Jews had agreed already that if he, any man did confess that he was Christ, he should be put out of the synagogue. Therefore his parents said, he's of age, ask him. Then again they called the man that was blind. Again, this is like the third or fourth time, and said unto him, give God the praise, we know that this man is a sinner. And he said in verse 25, well, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. But one thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. And then it says in verse 26, then they ask him again, fourth, fifth time, what did he do to thee? How did he open your eyes? They just kept on trying to get more evidence. 
They kept on asking questions, hoping to be able to prove that Jesus was not from God, hoping they could be able to figure out how this was going to slide into their box. They kept on digging for more information in hopes they'd find something to support their systems. They kept on finding more, getting more answers, getting more evidence, but never getting enough. Too often in our lives, we see God work, we hear God speak, we feel God nudge, but we keep on asking God for more evidence. It was, was it really you, God? God, is this you really, is this you really calling me? God, is this you really teaching me? God, is this you really convicting me? And we keep asking for more and more evidence. I need more confirmation. No matter how much is confirmed, just give me more proof, God. It's a sign that when you cannot accept God's will for your life, it's a sign that unbelief is present in your life. Sooner or later, you've got to accept the facts that God is a miracle-working God, and you need to move into what he's calling you to do. Move into the position. Take the step of faith and say yes to his will for your life. How much more proof do you need that he loves you? How much more proof does he need that you're forgiven? How much more proof do you need that you're called? Take a step of faith and say yes to his will. How many more words do you need to hear from another pastor, another prophet, another evangelist? How many more signs do you need to be sent? Shake off your unbelief and say, okay, God, I get it. It's got to be from you. Uh, when is enough enough? You keep asking questions and you keep getting the same answers. All roads you take lead you back to the same place. Y'all know what I'm talking about, right? You keep on dismissing and you'll take another detour and before long you're right back on the same road. And now you're trying to get more evidence and you're right back on the... Why don't you override unbelief and listen to this term, take a risk of faith and say yes to God. Sometimes in life you have to leave the comfortable and take a risk and say, God, I don't know where this is going, but I'm going to say yes. I don't see three steps ahead, but I see the next one. And I'm going to step out on faith, believe him. You've given me enough evidence and I'm tired of asking for evidence. I'm just going to trust you now. Some of you this morning need to finally say yes to the call of God in your life. Yes to God calling you back into position. Yes to God calling you to line up with him. Quit running from him and get in line with him he doesn't need to give you any more evidence he's been speaking over you for years say yes number three unbelief does bias research unbelief does bias research on purely subjective basis let's look at verse 24 again I'm gonna read I'm gonna pick up and read a little more so they called the man give God praise we know that this man is a sinner he answered and said whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. But one thing I know, I was blind, but now I see. Then they said to him again, what did, th what did he do to thee? How did he open your eyes? H tell me. And he answered them, I've told you already, and you did not hear. Wherefore, would you hear it again? If I keep saying it, are you ever going to hear it? Will you also be his disciples? These religious leaders were not seeking the truth. They were only trying to substantiate their claim that Jesus was not the Messiah. They were only trying to substantiate their claim that Jesus was not for God. They kept asking questions where there are answers already decided upon. Their minds were closed. Their hearts were hard. They just needed to prove that God could never use a man like Jesus, the son of some carpenter from Nazareth. Listen, unbelief will close your mind and close your heart to what God wants to do. Unbelief will cause you to avoid the truth, the signs, the facts, and the reality that God is moving. If you tell me again, even if he tells you again you ain't heard the first time, are you going to hear this time? Even if all the evidence is right in front of your face, it's easier to do biased research with preconceived ideas and false claims. Let me use the overused phrase of the last two years. Follow the science. I don't want to get blocked from social media. They ain't follow no science. They followed their preconceived ideas and found scientists that would prove their preconceived ideas. They were not seeking truth. Uh-oh, because anybody that spoke the truth got dismissed or canceled because they don't want truth. 
We're living in a society. They're not looking for the truth. They're looking for something to confirm their sin and that their sin is not wrong. And when you tell them it's sin, they cancel you. They stamp you. They mark you out. They block you out. Follow the science all you want to. The thing is, you're doing biased research, but there's only one way to get free, and that is through the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's only one way for the people who are bound in sin to be free, and it's not a feel-goodism. It's not accepting more people groups or more languages or more colors on the flag. There's only one thing that will give you freedom, and that is through Jesus Christ, the spotless Lamb of God. That's the research you need. He was in the beginning. He's in the middle. He'll be in the end. He was the God of Genesis and the God of Revelation. He's the God of the past and the God of the future. He is the Alpha, the Omega. I choose to stand in the truth that God is still God. Stop doing bias research. You're just trying to justify your lack. Uh, I wrote this, I added this when I edited this morning. Stop reading your Bible trying to justify a way out. Some of you read the Bible hoping you can find one phrase that will justify your adultery. If I can just find one thing. Oh, I got to find one passage of Scripture that will justify my alcohol. I got to find one passage of Scripture that will justify my cheating or my lying. And you don't ever read the Bible to get free. You read the Bible to justify something you ain't never going to be justified in. If you would just begin to read the Word, the Word of God will set you free and you are justified just as if you've never sinned when you come to the reality that Jesus is the only way. I remember being that teenage boy trying to justify my wrongs, hoping I could get some Christian to tell me it was all right. But here's the problem with number four. The fourth thing is unbelief rejects the facts. Unbelief rejects the facts. Verse 26, 27. Then went the captain with the officers and brought them within violence. Oh, Lord, i got to get onto the right page. I'm reading you out of Acts. I was justifying my sin and got on the wrong page. <laughs> Verse 26. Then they said to him again, what did he do? How did he open your eyes? I've told you already. You didn't hear. Wherefore, are you going to hear it again? Will you also be his disciples? Will you ever hear and believe? Listen, it didn't know this man was questioned and questioned and given authority and given authority. They, he kept on giving them the facts. His mom and daddies didn't told him who he was. The fact is the man was born blind. Everybody knew it, but the religious leaders refused to believe that the man from Galilee was able to heal him. Too many times our unbelief rejects the works of God. We deny, 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 almost like the Clinton years. If you can deny enough, deny enough, deny enough. And listen, we are living in a time when we are being told on the news media, oh, inflation ain't real, inflation ain't real. Ain't, gas prices are still low. Gas prices are still low. Bread is still in plenty. You got plenty of diapers. You got plenty of formula. Thank God you got something that's going to feed besides formula, I hope. You got plenty of all this stuff, plenty, 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 while we look at the shelves and see everything's empty. Prices are up, bread is up, milk is up. Why is it? And you know what spiritually, y'all, we do? We dismiss, dismiss. We deny conviction. We deny the call. We deny the anointing. We deny the Holy Ghost. We deny the works. We deny the miracles just because unbelief always rejects the truth. Instead of facing the reality that our lives are in need of an adjustment, <laughs> I feel a little nervous now. I feel a little nervous. My knees just felt a little wobble as I'm about to speak into this next topic. We will deny that we need to be saved because after all, I'm, at least I'm better than JoJo. Well, at least I don't act like that person that goes to church. 
And we reject the fact that God's telling us to get saved, telling us to get right, telling us to quit, telling us to... We reject all of that and we excuse away the power of God instead of humbling ourselves to where God can lift us up. So guess what we do? We keep trying to climb a ladder and make ourselves look a little more haughty and before long we keep tumbling down and God is saying, here I am. If you'll humble yourself under the high hand of God, I'll lift you up. And we reject, oh, I don't need to, I don't need to, I don't want to, I don't need to, not going to stop, not going to stop. It don't matter. It doesn't affect anybody. My family don't care. My wife don't care. My kids don't care. I'm going to do my... No, 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 no. They do care. The fact of the matter is they stopped expressing their care because they're tired of getting jumped on every time they show you they care. Lord, I've had a lot of ladies who've got old husbands. They don't even try to reach them no more because they have been cussed out pushed around, talked bad about, accused of stuff because when they try to give them Jesus, they get the devil out of that person. So they just said, forget it. Because unbelief always rejects the truth. Let us not ignore the works of God. Let us not reject the fact that Jesus is on the move, rising fun. Let us not reject the fact that God's trying to do a new thing in this church. Let us not reject the fact that God wants to release a power and anointing, not for seven in the altar, but all of us that are in the sanctuary. God is not trying to bless a handful. He's trying to bless a community. And through the community, he'll bless a region. Let us not be satisfied with a feel-goodism. Let's not reject the fact that God is raising up a remnant in the rising fine church of God that we can win this place for Jesus Amen. accept it don't reject him number five unbelief is self-centered unbelief is self-centered look at what happens this man gets frustrated verse 28 says they reviled him and said thou art his disciple we're Moses' disciples. We know that God spake unto Moses, as for this fellow, Jesus, we know not from whence he is. And the man answered and said unto them, Why herein is a marvelous thing that you know not from whence he is, and you know that he's opened mine eyes? Now we know that God heareth not sinners. But if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, God will hear him. Since the world began, was it not heard that any man opened the eyes of one that was born blind? If this man were not of God, this is the blind man, the former blind man saying, he could do nothing. And they answered him, verse 34, Thou wast altogether born in sin. You're a sinner. How dare you teach us? And they cast him out. How dare you teach me? You're a sinner. I'm a respected religious leader. How dare you try to give me a word? I'm a pastor. Get out of my presence. You see, unbelief will dismiss those who present facts that diminish who we think we are. Thank you, Stanley. You get a brownie. Cinnamon free. Unbelief dismisses those who present us with facts that diminish who we think we are. We don't want to be challenged. We don't want to be made to look like we've lost control. After all, our image is more important than God and His truth. A major problem in the church today is that as soon as the spotlight light turns off of us, we get offended and we fight to get back in the spotlight. We want so much to stay in focus that we refuse to become invisible so God can be seen. Now, we don't ever say what I'm about to say out loud, out loud. I want to be the center of attention. I must be seen and I must be heard. I must be admired and I must be adored. We don't say those things out loud. But our actions dictate it. And if that's not the case, then let me present you some points and I'm getting ready to close. Why are we so threatened by people who may do our jobs better than we do it? He's a better singer. I better find fault in him. He's a better preacher. He won't preach in this pulpit. She's a better leader. I better undermine her character. She's a better teacher. I can't let her voice be heard. 
And we begin a smear campaign and we begin to sow discord all because of self-centeredness. When we begin to move out of the spotlight, we'll, we'll knock somebody else down that's trying to, that God is moving into a position. We refuse to step out of the way. I know y'all wishing I'd hurry up and close. I'm going to make this point with the cleaning crew. And, and I, I, I think I'm safe. I'm looking around. Now, this is not the current cleaning crew. Do y'all know how many people, how many fights we've had in the church over the cleaning crew? No, in the cleaning crew. Do you know I've had to have meetings with people that sweep the floors? Because they got mad because somebody else was telling them how to sweep the floors? I, I'm telling the truth. I thought I was in charge of this cleaning crew and they done busted up in here trying to tell me how to do my job. I, I'm for real. I've had that, com that, that, that conversation more than once. You like that spotlight that much? That you mad that somebody's trying to help you mop the sanctuary better? Or doing it a better way than you're doing it? Now, some of y'all are going, I'd never be that silly. Well, will you not? You ever been offended when you didn't get asked to teach Sunday school? You ever been offended when your name wasn't the one called that got recognition for something that somebody else did and you thought you did it better and you should have been the one recognized? Churches get split over issues much smaller than that, all based on self-centeredness. It's a root of unbelief. The devil thinks if I can just cause that unbelief to stir in those people, I will, before long, I will shine a false spotlight on them and they'll, they'll walk in the wrong spotlight and I will cause division and I will destroy them and I will kill them. I'll do anything I can to them because I now have their heart. Unbelief will cause this church to live with a lot of religion but with no power. And a lot of people are happy not having the presence of God in church. Isn't it time to activate faith instead of avoiding it? Isn't it time to bow out of the spotlight and let Jesus be seen, let Jesus be heard? We must get to the place where God is the only thing that matters. We want Him to be glorified. We want God to be honored. If that's all that matters is that God gets the glory, let us move to the back seat so that God make me disappear if you'll get glory. Luke chapter 17, and I'm getting ready to close, but not, don't start the music yet. But get ready, Sadie, with the music, and I'll tell you when. Luke 17, verse 5 through 6, and the apostles said unto him, increase our faith. God, please increase. I've prayed that prayer mistakenly myself. All of us had. And the Lord said, well, my goodness, if you had faith as a grain of a mustard seed, you might say to the sycamore tree, be picked up by the root and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. Oh, God, give me more faith. We don't need more faith. We just need to activate the faith we've got. That's right. Amen. May I ask you a question in closing? Why is your faith not active? Is it a lack of courage? Is it a lack of confidence? Is it a lack of success? Are you intimidated? Are you afraid? Or maybe it's just a simple fact of you don't try. Why don't you activate your faith? And you know what happens? You hear a sermon like this that makes you want to activate your faith and the cycle starts over and you go, I don't have the courage. I don't have the confidence. I've never had success. I'm intimidated and I'm afraid. And the preacher says, come on, activate your faith. I can't. I'm intimidated. I'm afraid. I'm discouraged. I've never tried. Why don't we break free from unbelief? Break free from the characteristics of unbelief and begin to flow in faith so God can move mountains. See, I believe God wants to show us his glory. God wants to show us his power, but we've got to get into a place to where God can do his work. God doesn't move in unbelief. Faith unlocks the door in our lives. God tried to shake up our lives and we blamed the enemy. <laughs> I'm almost done. God will start shaking us. I rebuke the devil! Get out of here, devil! God is like, I ain't the devil. I'm just trying to 
I'm trying to grow you. I'm trying to stretch you. I'm trying to, I'm trying to teach you. And we, we, we laying hands on everything, got the oil out, anointing everything. Now, our bodies are greasy. Our cars are greasy. Our house is greasy. Our children are greasy. And God is just trying to get you to a place to say, yes, God. It ain't the devil. We got crucifix hanging all over the place. And God has just said, I'm just trying to get you to say yes. I'm just trying to get you to step out. But every time we push them away, we grow colder and harder. And the more we grow colder and harder, the more we grow meaner and meaner. Don't you think it's time to break out of unbelief today? Defeat these five characteristics. Stand with me. So I've asked Sadie to play a song today that Sister Sandra sent me. It's a song the praise team will be singing in the next couple of weeks. And I just want us right now, as that song begins to play, and Ben, you'll have to turn it off before the song plays. We've been flagged. They're muting our services because uh, we don't have rights to this music. And uh, so a lot of our portion is now silent. So uh, we'll just pause, and then we'll start the music so that people can, uh, we can hear the music. 